thank you very much for the call, Albert. Sean in Cincinnati. Hey, Sean, what's up? Hey, Tom, what are we show, man? I, listen, I just want to, uh, you know, I think we're going to find out that Bob was a liar in a cell, and uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Huffington Post just spoke to Florida where uh, they now have uh, document proof of this signature on at least six different documents pertaining to acquisitions that Payne Capital made from 99 to 2002. Oh, really? Now that's yeah, this is yeah. this is what I was saying. In fact, there it is. I'm, I just pulled up how how many closing ten. Romney at work during retirement. Um, this this just makes common sense. I mean, as a business person myself, you know, I haven't built a business as successful as as you know hundreds of millions as, as Romney did. But, um, my businesses actually generally made things and did things for people right. rather than buying and selling businesses. But but if I had all of my all of my wealth, all of my future, all of my you know blood, sweat, and tears tied up in in my one business that I had built in my life, and I went off to do something for my country for a couple of years, and and it wasn't like joining the military. I mean, he it, when he went out to Salt Lake City, he could hop on a you know he, the guy's got a private plane. He could come home on the weekends. He could come home every Thursday. He could spend every third week get a back and forth. You know, he, it's like, it's like this is not rocket science. You you look over your assets. You look out for what's going on. So, yeah, well, I'm a former business owner myself, and I, I, I mean, I just knew from day one that something that just was, I mean, it wasn't right. And, yeah. uh, you know, the people like just come out to buy it, just see the vibe of the since I read it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thanks a lot, Sean. I uh, appreciate it. Pete in Chicago, hey, Pete, what's up? Hey, how are you? I got a financial uh, thing for you, but first I want to tell you, your show actually works. I'm one of those that used to be a staunch right wing conservative. That seem to like, and I like 90% over at your site now. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you. It does bear, it does bear fruit. Thank you. So the reason I called is yesterday morning on the, on the Financial News Network on television, mm -hmm. they had an interview with Warren Buffett, uh, former Senator Simpson from Wyoming, right. awesome. and uh, Erskine Bowles. Right. I don't know if you caught that or not. I didn't. But they were talking about the precarious situation, and what shocked me was that they asked uh, Mr. Bowles if he thought we could still avoid going over the precedent. Right. And he said, considering the seriousness of the magnitude of our financial difficulties and the probability that Congress is incapable of doing anything to prevent it, he says, as far as he's concerned, it's a done deal. We're going over the edge. There's no stopping anymore. Yeah, I agree. It's more shocking. I agree with that. Bowles and Simpson, and not Bowles, but uh, Buffett and Simpson concurred. This is shocking news. Yeah. Why is, it on the, why is it on headline news? Uh, it's a very good question, especially if Warren Buffett. You know, Alan Simpson and, and, and Erskine Bowles have been, uh, you know, their, their credibility got sidelined when they couldn't come out with, with a single consensus report from their committee, you know. And, and so they, they came up with their own report, which was not the official legal report. Everybody refers to it as if it was, but it wasn't. Um, but Warren Buffett has considerable credibility, you know, he's like, you know, he's doing very well, thank you very much. And, and he makes his money betting on which way the market's going to go and where companies are going to go. And it would be really, really interesting to look into the Berkshire Hathaway balance sheet and find out how liquid he's getting, how much he's converting into cash. Buffett, the company he owns, for the most part, he owns them outright. He can write out any storm. Right. He has gone out and borrowed 90% of the money to buy these things. You know what I mean? Right. So even if we do go over the edge, companies he owns are all going to survive. They may have tough times, they may not make as much profit, but it's going to survive. Yeah. And, are going to survive. Yeah, and you may see Hathaway stock, you know, drop from $10,000 a share to $8,000 a share, but it'll come back eventually. Um, but the shocking thing is that if we're on the edge of the precipice and the consensus of people of that stature is that there's no saving us anymore, I can't. That should be ringing bells all over the place. Yeah. Well, I've been singing this song for a couple of years here. I, you know, I've, uh, I've predicted the crash before it happened, and and since the crash, I've been saying this is not the end. We are in a bubble. We are not in a recovery, and because the fundamentals have not been changed, and we need yeah. and, and Harry, whoever the next president is, uh, whoever wins, uh, I'm telling you, he's gonna. It's gonna be a. I think the next four years is gonna be a disaster. It's going to be, they're going to be very interesting because I think that as bad as it's going to get, it's also going to be the salvation of this country. Because when it gets that bad, that's the point at which the American people are going to wake up and say, whoa, wait a minute, this, this Reaganomic stuff is not working. Just like they woke up in the 30s out of Coolidge economics in the 20s. 
This is the Tom Hartman Program. And Hoovernomics and Hardingnomics. Actually, Warren Harding started in the election of 1920 with his slogan, his election slogan, more business in government, less government in business. This is very interesting, though, the, this breaking news here with uh, having a post, and, and presumably everybody will have it in the next few minutes, that Romney signed all these documents while he was supposedly not working for a bank. Uh, right. Larry in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Hey, Larry, thanks for watching. Please speak to you. That's only my day. Oh, uh, love the show. I watch it all the time. Uh, I was, you know, they're throwing around billion dollars like uh, it's nothing. Uh, they had a spokesman for the, that was talking for, uh, I'm a little nervous here, <laughs> after $5 billion that they lost, Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. Stanley Morgan. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, are you, yeah, actually, dollars. I think you're thinking of J.P. Morgan Chase. It was, uh, uh, yeah, 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 Mr. Diamond. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was thinking, I, I make 18,000 years, so I can live 50 years and not know what a billion dollars is. Uh, okay. I was just trying to get my brain around $50 billion. I wrote it down. I got like, our population is 300 million people. Right. Or right around 300 million people. Yep. And they just spend, you know, they talk like five, one, one of their spokesmen said $5 billion. It's like a blip on the screen. They're going to make over thirty million dollars this year. You know, and mm -hmm. like a uh, five billion dollars was a blip on the screen. So. And they they can take a, and make everybody here a millionaire, and in two months we'll be out of debt. Well, I mean, no, I don't think it would be that much because if if you gave if, you know five three billion dollars, if you gave all three hundred million, well, actually I guess like three hundred and twenty or three hundred thirty million of us, but like, let's say 300 million round number. If, if everybody had $10, that's $3 billion. If everybody had $100, that's $30 billion. If everybody had $1,000, that's $300 billion. And giving everybody $1,000 is still not that much money, $300 billion. If everybody had $10,000, that's $3 trillion. And that's, that's, you know, still, that's a lot of money. And $10,000 for everybody in the country is a lot of money. But, but three trillion is, you know, our G our GDP is around fifteen trillion. So, am I making sense? How can how can three hundred million uh, people getting a million getting a million dollars a piece be that three hundred million dollars? No, it wouldn't. It would be that would be three hundred million times a million, which would be quadrillions. It would be way beyond trillions. It would be it would be thousands of trillions, tens of thousands of trillions, and yeah, yeah you, 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 your math is quite that way. Um, and it, 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 well, yeah, well, it, but but your point, I think your point is really an important one, and that is that that there is a a group of people out there for whom five billion dollars is a blip on the screen, and you know, for, for somebody who makes eighteen grand a year. Or somebody, somebody who makes anything, you know, who's got a, somebody who's earning a wage, whether it's five thousand dollars a year or fifty thousand dollars a year, to 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 know that, you know, the guy down the street might think that five billion dollars is a blip on the screen is like, what universe are we living in? You know, do we really, do we really have such an aristocracy in this country, in this world, where people have that kind of money? I mean, it is, it is mind-boggling. Larry, thank you for the call. Thanks for watching Free Speech TV. I appreciate it. It's nice to hear from you. And I think that that's really the issue. This is my rant from a couple of days ago. Let's outlaw billionaires. Let's just have a 100% tax on all wealth over $999 million. You can't live on $999 million? You got a problem.
go. Friday the 13th. Welcome back. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's just amazing. Poor guy around me. He's, he's going to do interviews with everybody today. And hoping that he's going to just put this thing to bed. We'll see. Patty, in a final Georgia. Hey, Patty, go find your mom. Hey, Sean, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? Hold on for a second. I apologize about that. All right. Are you there? Are you still there, Bob? Yes. Well, okay. See you on the other. I have a question about LIBOR. Um, the, I wrote a chart on like, I don't know how simple it is, that the, the rate that the municipality is trying to claim bondholders with a, a rate of like basically auction security rates, which were not at all tied to LIBOR. So when the, the blank hit the fan back in two, 2008, um, and regular market rate went through the roof. LIBOR officially was big, pretty low. Mm -hmm. The municipality, in effect, didn't even have a, a, a fixed rate of interest. Because they were, the interest that they were um, marketing is based on a artificially spread index. That's right. They were, they were having to pay out the okay, sorry. No, I, you're, you're right. They were artificially pushing it down. Yes. Right. So, like, I guess the point is, is that, um, that even if even if they were artificially putting it, pushing it down, they still thought they were in a fixed rate, right? Right. So, as, as long as the auction rates are tied to LIBOR, then they should be in a fixed rate. Um, but here's the problem: during that period of time, those municipalities yeah. could not borrow at that rate. There was no money in right. Nobody was lending. So it was a phony baloney rate. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just okay, the only place I've read that has actually made that point is is Fire Dog Lake. Everybody else kind of puts it in the narrative that hey, they 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 entered into a fixed rate mm -hmm. at, at when the rates were high and then um and then got you know screwed because rates actually went um lower. Right. And in fact, they didn't even get a fixed rate. They they, they end up uh, having the worst of both worlds. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is this is the argument that the city of Baltimore is making right now and making it very aggressive. And you know, we'll okay. see. I mean they're 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 looking to demonstrate that they have been harmed by this. I think if they can, we had a caller earlier pointing out that this falls right smack dab in the in the process of, of the RICO laws, the racketeering laws. And uh We'll, we'll see where this, where this goes. But, um, yeah, I, Patty, my, my, my thought on that was that, that because the markets were frozen, because there was no money available, had LIBOR actually reflected the actual risk of lending and the actual availability, you know, the actual cost of money, then there would have been money available. And the markets might not have frozen up if, mark, if LIBOR wasn't being manipulated. If that makes any sense, I, I think it you know, makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean if, if, if a bank, if a bank, you know, if Baltimore's having is needing money, and the bank is saying, okay, uh, you know, we're committed to, to lend to you at the LIBOR rate, and the LIBOR rate is two and a half percent, but you know, right now, the money has become precious, right? It's, it's hard to get money. Well, when it's hard to get money, the value of money goes up. That means interest rates go up. So, you know, the, the city might be willing to pay three or four or five percent, and the bank actually might loan three or four or five percent, you know, during a, during a tough time because, hey, you know, there's a, there's a risk reward ratio here, which LIBOR is supposed to reflect. But if LIBOR is artificially low, the bank is looking at that going, I'm not going to loan that rate. And the city's going, we can't borrow at this rate. And then they're really screwed. And then you get this, this freezing up of the markets. Yeah, I, I, now, I'm not speculating about this. I don't have actual evidence of this. This is just, I mean, just running logic here. Well, I mean, I, okay, I'm saying I don't understand all the logic. It doesn't matter what they say the libel as. Nobody was going to lend money after Lane Brothers fell. Because there was just a serious question of the liquidity of all counterparties, right? Well, no, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, there were there were plenty of very liquid counterparties out there, that, including municipalities and including some very large corporations. And I mean, there was a lot of concern about financial okay. institutions after Lehman okay. But I don't think that there was any serious doubt that ExxonMobil was going to 
run out of money or that Apple was going to run out of cash? Well, let's see how you think. That is assuming they have all the cash involved somewhere on. Well, they do. I mean, you've got, you know, transactional space in the United States right now sitting on $2 trillion dollars in the U.S. And hold it in a bank, though. And that bank's already, I mean, the bank has it basically, they live it most of it out. I mean, they only keep like, what, 10, 20% in reserve? That's a lot less than that. Yeah, yeah. So that, well, like that Exxon Mobility would put it in based on whatever the depository institution's liquidity is. And if the depository institution's liquidity, yeah, I mean, if, it's, if they have to deposit the Bank of America, who still work with, then they still have no mobile deal with it as well. So that, yeah, so I'm not sure. I, again, you know, I think there was some, yeah, I, I think once, the question, yeah. the question at the core of all of this is, well, well how did I get hurt? Right? How did you and I get hurt? How did Baltimore get hurt? It, 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 if, if, if it's just, you know, the big boys making some money and, and scamming each other, uh, you know, most, most people would just shrug their shoulders. If, if, you know, and, you know, yeah, let them get prosecuted, you know, it's sort of like, you know, it was Martha Stewart trading on inside information, and that wasn't actually what she was even prosecuted for, was lying about it. But, um, you know, it's just that kind of thing. It doesn't affect me. But, uh, you know, if there's an actual harm to us, then it does affect us. And, and there are a number of municipalities and a number of pension funds that are asserting that there was a harm, there was a kind of harm to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The and the rates that were being paid and their ability to get financing and to continue operations that had to do with LIBOR being great. And, and, and you and I both need to, we, you know, we need to learn a lot more about this. All of us need to learn a lot more about this as the, as this kind of thing unravels. Yeah.